Yeah. Shoo. Welcome to the Red Road East. I am your host, Fierce Truth Seeker. And we are continuing with the discussion of Moors and Indians, friends or enemies. And this is part 19 of that lecture. And this is actually part 19 of that particular series. And this is lecture number 10 of the Garvey question. The question of whether or not Marcus Garvey was a government agent. Okay. And so far, the fierce truth seeker has proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that Garvey is innocent of all charges. Okay. And we want to today continue that discussion because like I said, Garvey is has such an extensive history until it really takes you can't just have a Garvey discussion in just a few hours. Okay. It, it really deserves a lot of attention because you gotta remember he had the largest movement among our people of all times okay so for that reason it deserves a lot of attention and you really can't do any type of microwave scholarship when talking about Garvey and his organization okay and again like I said before, I know firsthand, being that in my younger years, I belonged to a Garvey organization. So I used to distribute the literature on Garvey and also sell the work, the books of Tony Martin in his whole body of work dealing with Marcus Garvey. So not to toot my own horn, but I know quite a bit about Garvey, okay? And again, this particular discussion was inspired by a long, heated debate that I had with a dear, close friend of mine who's like a brother. And... We had a long, heated discussion for hours. So, and even that long discussion was not enough to bring about, or should I say, not long enough to really make my point. Okay, so I decided to organize all of my information and present it in an organized fashion so that it could be more understandable for someone who knows very little or has done minimal research on Garby or his organization. Okay. So with that being said, I want to get into the discussion and the last time that we were talking about Garvey yesterday, there was someone in the chat who seemed quite disturbed about the discussion. And obviously, this person came into the discussion just yesterday because what he was angry about 
was stuff that was already discussed in the past nine discussions. Well, yesterday was the past eight discussions before that one. Okay. And so I had already debunked, you know, there's no question about, you know, whether or not Garvey is innocent, you know, because I had already debunked the myth that he was guilty of mail fraud, guilty of being an agent, guilty guilty of trying to lead the Ab- Aborigines astray and all of that. I had already put all of that into perspective. So this particular individual who came in the chat yesterday obviously came in late. So the thing is that it was it was a guy named Jackman. Okay. And the thing is that if you come to a university and you haven't been to kindergarten yet, what's going to happen? You're going to be lost, obviously. Okay? So he hadn't gone to kindergarten yet and heard the previous lectures. And he tried to come into the university, which is the level that we're at right now. Okay? So he was lost. Okay? So... And I'll read the comment because it makes a good topic of discussion. And comment was from a guy named Jackman. And he says, this cat is a typical Pan-Africanist. Okay, let's deal with that. It's okay, I'll read the whole comment first. He says, this cat is a typical Pan-Africanist. Marcus Garvey indeed worked with the secret societies that were leading the back to Africa movements because like them, he too was a Mason. Okay, let's deal with the first part of that comment. So first of all, I am not a Pan-Africanist. Okay, and neither was Garvey. See, again, people don't do their research, you know, and I did give Jackman an opportunity to present evidence of the things that he was saying, and he could not produce the evidence. And again, like I said yesterday, you can't come on this platform and just talk. You have to produce evidence. You source up or shut up. Okay, so I gave him ample time to produce evidence of which he could not. Okay, so when you do that on this channel, you get relegated to the corner room of pseudo. You get relegated to the pseudo room. Okay, and I'm not a Pan-Africanist. Garvey was not even a Pan-Africanist. Okay, Garvey was uh, what they call a black nationalist. There's a difference. Okay. All right. I'm neither one. Okay. However, I don't have, I'm not brainwashed like a lot of you who come in the chat and call yourselves Aborigines and stuff. I'm not brainwashed like a lot of you guys are. I don't have any... You have to pardon me. A lot of feedback from outside, which is another thing too. I pardon. I beg your pardon, everyone in YouTube land, for starting the presentation late, and it's because of all the noise. Again, I'm in the boogie down Bronx, right in the heart of the Bronx, and 24 hours, seven days a week, it's noise. So that's why I couldn't come in before. It was just too much noise. Anyway, so like I was saying, okay. Um, I don't, I, you know, I'm not brainwashed like a lot of the younger generation who calls themselves Aborigines. I'm not brainwashed. You guys believe Tarzan of the jungle. You guys feel that uh, you have a complex about Africa. I don't have a complex about Africa, so I don't have a problem with talking about 
um, or saying the word Africa. A lot of people, you say the word Africa with the younger generation, you know, and they damn near have a heart attack, okay? Uh, I'm not brainwashed like that. So because I'm not brainwashed, you know, don't look at me cross-eyed because you're brainwashed, okay? You believe all of the stuff that they put out in the media about the starving Ethiopians and about, uh, you know, uh, people running around in the jungles of Africa naked and stuff like that. You believe that. But because you're dumb enough to believe something like that, don't expect for me to be as stupid as you are. Okay. So with that being said, you know, I present information as it is. I don't try to put a spin on information. I don't try to create a false narrative. Okay. I produce the evidence as it stands. Okay. I produce competent research for those who are my subscribers. Okay. I'm not going to have y'all out there looking like a damn fool. Okay. And that's why I have the name Fierce. That's why I was given the name Fierce Truth Seeker. Okay. Because I just present the truth, no matter what that truth is. Okay. So, with that being said, let's deal with the other part of that particular comment. So, Jackman says, Marcus Garvey indeed worked with the secret societies that were leading the Back to Africa movement because, like them, he too was a Mason. Okay? Again, no one can prove that. Okay? Was he a Mason? Yes, Marcus Garvey, like damn near everybody, of that era were Masons, just like the majority of you Negroes calling yourselves Aborigines or whatever, whether you call yourself Aborigines, whether you call, whether you call yourself Afrocentric, Pan-Africanist or whatever, you go back in your own family. And I guarantee you, somebody in your family, whether they be your grand grandfather, grand uh, or great grandfather or whatever i guarantee you some of them were masons or grandmother or great grandmother i guarantee you or aunt or whatever I guarantee you a lot of them were eastern stars guarantee you and if you say no i know that you're lying okay particularly in the south all i mean not just all over but you know particularly in the south and and, and, and and damn sure in the Caribbean. Okay. So, yes, he was a Mason, you, you know, in, in the Caribbean, you know, they have a lot of, they have the order of mechanics. Okay. Now, just because he was a Mason, that doesn't mean anything. A whole lot of people were Masons. Furthermore, he joined but he never, Garvey never attended any meetings, okay? He was too busy to attend meetings and things of that nature. He was too busy trying to liberate the, trying to liberate his people, okay? And that's documented. And no one can produce any evidence to the contrary. I can produce evidence of what I'm saying, on the other hand. Okay, so we can shut that down. So that's two arguments that we just dismiss, just like that, you know? And that's why the fierce truth seeker doesn't do debates and things like that. I only debate my peers, all others I teach, okay? Because, you know, you can't come here with pseudo arguments and frivolous fugazi arguments to street corner scholarship and you haven't even read any books okay i ask most of the people who come to me with this garvey stuff what books have you read on garvey 
and none of them can tell me one book you know i think i only there was one person in the chat who referenced one book and that was just one book okay he who knows one book knows none okay so this guy jack man says i'm a typical pan-africanist okay so ignorance abounds out of the mouth of he who knows not what he speaks okay not a pan-africanist you can try to dismiss the facts and evidence that i've produced and you can interpret it that way but that's out of your ignorance okay i am the fierce truth seeker of the red road east and i've been walking the red road longer than most okay when most of those out there calling themselves aborigines today probably longer than a lot of them were even born Okay, walking the red road and producing this information. Reading books, a lot of the books and stuff that, that a lot of guys are talking about now, I read th those books like 30 years ago <laughs> and talking about them like 30 years ago. I was talking about these books and, you know, these these histories and stuff like that, you know. Is this stuff, a lot of stuff that people are talking about now is super old news for me <laughs> i'm on record talking about this stuff okay so for someone to come here and refer to me as a pan-africanist and i'm one of the pioneers of this shit you know uh you know you make an ass out of yourself you assume you know as i say when you assume you make an ass out of yourself you make an ass out of you and me you ever heard that you know so anyway, let's get into some, I don't like to just talk. I like to produce evidence, okay? And so let's get into some documents here. Give me one second, I'm gonna pull up, excuse me, I'm gonna pull up a document. And hold on. For those who are generous enough to leave a donation, I'm going to leave where you can leave a cash app donation. Give me one second. Okay, so, okay, we have someone who's joined us, all right, Curtis Jean Lewis says, good work, don't stop, thanks for the words of encouragement, uh, Curtis, okay, because a lot of people don't appreciate honesty, see, if I was scamming people, I'd have shoot man i'd have about three thousand followers you know our people love scammers if i was lying to the people you know i'd have probably ten thousand followers and subscribers you know uh, and views you know i probably have ten thousand views and fifty thousand subscribers you know if i was scamming you know and selling snake oil you know and and you know, having this as a Jerry Springer circus, you know, I'd have a whole lot of followers then, you know, but for some reason, our people love to follow scammers, you know, if I was doing the brother polite, <laughs> oh man, I hate to call names, I don't want to call names, you know, but that's like public knowledge anyway, uh, if I was, <laughs> you know, or if, if, you know, I had, you know, I was, you know, like on the Afrocentric channel and, 
you know, had this thing as a Jerry Springer type of show, you know. But anyway, uh, I'm going to leave for anyone that's interested in leaving a donation. That's the Cash App right there, okay? It's dollar sign, K-Love, 83. Don't put the dash there. It's just dollar sign, K-Love, 83. I'm going to put it again so that people are not confused. We'll put it again. Dollar sign, capital K. That's it right there. Okay. Anyway. So let's get into some documents here. So what we what I want to do is I want to continue the what I was reading from yesterday. And yesterday I was reading from this document on Garvey that talked about Garvey's Garvey's life and works. And this was from nationalhumanitiescenter.org, okay? And we left off where it was talking about Garvey and Booker T. Washington, okay? And how Garvey was a student of Booker T. Washington. He was very impressed by Booker T. Washington, okay? And it inspired him to try to reduplicate what Booker T. Washington was doing here in Jamaica. <clears throat> However, the people in Jamaica at that time were not receptive to that, you know, again, the mental conditioning of colonialism, okay? So he had to come to the States, okay? And he studied our people. Garvey was not the first, as I proved, as I had proven in the past nine lectures before this one on Garvey, okay, I had proven that there were many people before Garvey who had back to Africa movements, okay? And we're talking about even before the colonization society and stuff like that, okay? Uh, with Liberia and all that. There were plenty of people who actually were proponents of a back to Africa movement among our people who didn't follow. I'm not talking about following any European society or Caucasian society or anything like that, who created that themselves, okay? And some of which who were American Indians, okay? such as Paul Cuffey, okay? And so, and Prince Hall, okay? And it was not that they were trying to lead the Aborigines astray or anything like that. What they were trying to do was get from under uh, Caucasian oppression, okay? and to be able to set up a power base where they could be uninterrupted and not be shut down by the powers that be. So they looked to Africa because there they saw a place where the people who were ruling were people who looked like us, okay? And it had nothing to do with all that other stuff that people are trying to make it today. Again, you can't take modern ideologies and make them retroactive, okay? So, and I showed plenty of people. Garvey, Garvey had studied our people, okay? And Garvey had studied the movements that came before him, okay? And the many movements that were trying to get our people from up under oppression. Okay, and the ones who he was impressed by were those who were not trying to integrate into Caucasian society. Okay, Garvey is what they call a separatist, and that's why he wanted to 
set up a base in Africa because he wanted to be separate from Caucasian people. It wasn't all this other stuff that people are talking about. See, when people read and do research, a lot of times people are not putting things in its proper perspective, okay? And why people did things at certain points in history. See, you have to study the movements. You know, what a lot of people not, are not doing in their research, they're not studying the movements that have sprung up among our people in history, okay? I took African-American studies in college, okay? But I wasn't conditioned by it because I had already had knowledge of self when I was taking it. However, you know, I took those courses because if you want to be proficient in something, then you should immerse yourself in a particular area of study, okay, and get the credentials, okay, and put in the proper and required amount of research, okay, research time, and that's what I did, okay, so nobody can just come to me and just say anything and expect me to co-sign on it if I know that it is bullshit, excuse my expression, okay, because I have the credentials to know otherwise, credentials from a scholastic point of view and also from experience in being involved in various movements, okay, so with that being said, I'm going to proceed and read from this document from where we left off. So we left off talking about Booker T. Washington. Okay. So it said, Garvey embraced Washington's ideas and returned to Jamaica in 1914 to found the UNIA with the motto, one God, one aim, and one destiny. Okay. And that was by way of his Islamic influence with Dusay Muhammad who we went over yesterday and in some of the previous discussions, okay? And so someone, uh, oh, never mind. That was something else. Okay, anyway, so it says here, initially he kept very much in line with Washington by encouraging his fellow Jamaicans of African descent to work hard, demonstrate good morals and a strong character and not worry about politics as a tool to advance their cause. Garvey did not make much headway in Jamaica and decided to visit America in order to meet Booker T. Washington and learn about the situation of African Americans. By the time Garvey arrived in America in 1916, Washington had died, but Garvey decided to travel around the country and observe African Americans and their struggle for equal rights. What Garvey saw was a shifting population and a diminishing hope in Jim Crow's demise. African Americans were moving in large numbers out of the rural South and into the urban areas of both North and South. As World War I came to an end, disillusionment was beginning to take hold. Not only was the optimism in the continuing improvement of humanity and society broken apart, but so was any hope on the part of African Americans that they would gain the rights enjoyed by every white American citizen. African Americans had served in large numbers in the war, and many expected the same kind of respect and acknowledgement that they too were equal citizens. Indeed, World War I was the perfect opportunity for African Americans to fulfill Booker T. Washington's requirement for equality and freedom. Though dedicated service and armed forces, they, I'm sorry, not though, through, through dedicated service in the armed forces, they could prove their worth and show they deserved the same rights as whites. However, as black soldiers returned from the war, 
and more and more African Americans moved to the urban areas, racial tensions grew. Between 1917 and 1919, race riots erupted in East St. Louis, Chicago, Tulsa, and other cities, demonstrating that whites did not intend to treat African Americans any differently than they had before the, before the war. After surveying the racial situation in America, Garvey was convinced that integration would never happen and that only economic, political, and cultural success on the part of African Americans would bring about equality and respect. With this goal, he established the headquarters of the UNIA in New York in 1917 and began to spread the message of Black nationalism and the eventual return to Africa of all people of African descent. His brand of Black nationalism had three components, unity, pride in the African cultural heritage, and complete autonomy. Garvey believed people of African descent could establish a great independent nation in their ancient homeland of Africa. He took the self-help message of Washington and adopted it to the situation he saw in America, taking a somewhat individualistic and integrationist philosophy and turning it into a more corporate and politically minded nation building message. And let me interject here. So obviously we're seeing some terms in this article such as African-American and also concepts of so-called African-Americans being of African descent and this, that, and the other, okay? And we have to remember as we said in previous lectures at the time, okay, we didn't have a lot of this information that we have today. Certain individuals here and there had that information, but for the most part, most of our people were Judeo-Christian minded, okay? And using the Bible, you know, the Bible was more so the historic reference than anything. So, Humanity's origins were orientated towards the East, you know, based on the religious mindset of our people at the time. So that's why you see, you'll see it in a lot of these movements. You'll see a lot of reference to Africa and the East and things of that nature. Okay. It was because of the lack of information like what we have now. So you can't use the Aborigine argument and say, okay, Garvey was an agent or that person was an agent because they're talking about Africa, this, that, and the other, because this ideology that we have today did not exist back then, only among, you know, uh, a certain few elders here and there, but not as a school of thought and not as mass movements, okay? So this is where you have to put what you read into its proper historical context. Okay, with that being said, I'm going to uh, read on. So it says, in 1919, Garvey purchased an auditorium in Harlem and named it Liberty Hall. There, he held nightly meetings to get his message out, sometimes to an audience of 6,000. In 1918, he began a newspaper, Negro World, which by 1920 had a circulation somewhere between 50,000 and 200,000. Membership in the UNIA is difficult to assess. At one point, Garvey claimed to have 6 million members. That figure is most likely inflated. However, it is beyond dispute that millions were involved and definitely affected by Garvey's message. And that is true. He had millions of followers. To promote unity, Garvey encouraged African Americans to be concerned with themselves first. He stated after World War I that the first dying that is to be done by the black man is in the future will be done to make himself free. And then when we are finished, if we have any charity to bestow, we may die for the white man. But as for me, I think I have stopped dying for him. This is Garvey speaking. Black people had to do the work that success and independence demanded. And most important, they had to do work for themselves. If you want liberty, 
claimed Garvey to a meeting held in 1921, you yourselves must strike the blow. You must be free. You must become so thorough. I mean, you know, you must be free. You must become so through your own effort. In other words, what he's saying is that you can't look for the Caucasian man to free you. He, everything has to be self-determination and you can't depend on any other races for your liberation. Okay, so it says here, but Garvey knew African-Americans would not take action if they did not change their perceptions of themselves. He hammered home the idea of racial pride by celebrating the African past and encouraging African-Americans to be proud of their heritage and be proud of the way they looked. Garvey proclaimed, black is beautiful, long before it became popular in the 1960s. He wanted African-Americans to see themselves as members of a mighty race. We must canonize our own saints, create our own martyrs, and elevate to positions of fame and honor Black men and women who have made their distinct contributions to our racial history. He encouraged parents to give their children dolls that look like them to play with and cuddle. And he did not want Black people thinking of themselves in a defeatist way. I am equal of any white man. I want you to feel the same way. Garvey, so Garvey was big on racial pride. Garvey was big on not trying to uh, uh, fix yourself to look like Caucasians, you know, straighten your hair or any of that kind of foolishness, lighten up your skin or any of that stuff and, or have the inferior mindset that a lot of our people had during that time. Okay, Garvey struck that down vehemently. Okay, and so people are saying that Garvey was an agent. Well, if he was an agent, I, I, I want to follow that kind of agent. <laughs> okay, which he wasn't anyway. But, you know, a lot of people, again, they're not doing their research. Okay, so it says here, Garvey organized his group in a way that made those sentiments visible. He created an African legion that dressed in military garb, uniformed, and again, this is before the NOI. I mean, I'm sorry, this is before the FOI, okay, the fruit of Islam, okay, because you got to remember Elijah Muhammad was part of the Garvey movement, okay, so he took a lot of those concepts and, you know, put it into the nation of Islam, okay, so it says here, had the African Legion dressed in military garb, uniformed marching, uniformed marching bands, and other auxiliary and other auxiliary groups such as the Black Cross Nurses. He was elected in 1920 as provisional president of Africa by the members of the UNIA and dressed in military uniform that with a plumed hat. At the UNIA's first international convention in 1920, people lined in the streets of Harlem to watch Garvey and his followers dressed in their military outfits, marched to where, I'm sorry, marched to their meeting under the banners of, we want a black civilization and Africa must be free. All the pomp brought Garvey ridicule from mainstream African-American leaders, but it also served to inspire many African-Americans who had never seen black people so bold and daring, okay? So Garvey came under heavy criticism by the coons of his day because a lot of them were pushing integration while Garvey was saying, you know, forget about trying to sit on the toilet next to Caucasians and integrating into Caucasian stores that didn't want you there patronizing them, okay? And having coffee thrown on, on you and having little Caucasian boys putting their foot in grown men's behinds and spitting on them and stuff like that, okay? God was saying, forget about that. Let's create our own, 
Okay, so the integrationists at that time who were the coons, they didn't want to hear that. Okay, they wanted to integrate. And those are the ones who had Caucasian foot up a lot of their asses. Okay, so anyway, but that didn't, you didn't, you didn't see that happening to the quote unquote black nationalists of that particular time okay so anyway reading on it says here while racial pride and unity played important roles in garvey's black nationalism he touted capitalism as the tool that would establish african americans as an independent group his message has been called the evangel of black success for he believed economic success was the quickest and most effective way to independence interestingly enough it was white america that served as a prime example of what blacks could accomplish until you produce what the white man has produced he claimed you will not be his equal in 1919 he established the negro factories corporation and offered stock for African Americans to buy. He wanted to produce everything that a nation needed so that African Americans could completely rely on their own efforts. At one point, the corporation operated three grocery stores, two restaurants, a printing plant, a steam laundry, and owned several buildings and trucks in New York City alone. His most famous economic venture was a shipping company known as the Black Star Line, a counterpart to a white-owned company called the White Star Line. Garvey started the shipping company in 1919 as a way to promote trade, but also to transport passengers to Africa. He believed it could also serve as an important and tangible sign of black success. However, the shipping company eventually failed due to expensive repairs, mismanagement, and corruption. So let me stop there. So a lot of people were accusing Garvey of mail fraud, okay? And this is this was false, okay? And he was accused on a trumped up charge of fraud in a kangaroo court, okay? And they sent spies and agents and stuff like that, you know, to help along to add to the confusion. Okay. So anyway, I'll read on with all this, with all his talk of a mighty race that would one day rule Africa, it would have been foolish for Garvey to underestimate the power of religion, particularly Christianity with the African-American community. The churches served as the only arena in which African-Americans exercised full control. Not only did they serve as houses of worship, but also as meeting places that dealt with social, economic, and political issues. Pastors were the most powerful people in the community for they influenced and controlled the community's most important institution. Let me stop right there. So this is evidence of what I was saying earlier, okay? The influence that the church and Christianity had on our people and our people's concepts of where they came from and things of that nature. So again, you can't take, you can't accuse Garvey and people like him of that day and accuse them of being agents and say, you know, he's responsible for, uh, uh, telling the Aborigines that they were African and trying to take them off of the land and things of that nature. You, 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 th those ideologies did not exist back then. Okay. So you can't take modern ideologies and make them retroactive. Okay. Our people were lulled to sleep. So they forgot that they were Aboriginal, you know, a lot of them didn't even know because their own families a lot of times didn't even tell their own grandparents and stuff didn't tell them for fear of 
the persecution that they would face, okay? Because if you're indigenous to the land, you're a threat, okay? So you would just hear like rumors in your family and, you know, certain things pass around. But, you know, a lot of times you didn't get a whole lot of detail and things of that nature because that stuff was hush hush. Okay. So, you know, our people find, found solace in the church, in Christianity, and, you know, Judeo Christian ideologies. Okay. And so that's a factor that a lot of people are leaving out of their research when they're doing their criticisms on people and movements of that day, okay? And even before that day, as we showed and demonstrated in the previous Garvey lectures, this is lecture number 10, just on Garvey alone, okay? Just on Garvey alone. So if there's anyone new, Oh, okay, I see we got Carlton Walker in here. Hey, what's up, Carlton? It's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while. Peace unto you, my good brother. Yeah, so anyone who's just joining on this discussion on Garvey, we did nine other lectures just on Garvey alone that led up to what we're talking about tonight. So anyway, so reading on says here, Garvey knew the important place religion held and he worked hard to recruit pastors into his organization. He enjoyed tremendous excess, I'm sorry, he enjoyed tremendous success at winning over leaders from almost every denomination. One of, one of those clergymen, George Alexander McGuire, an Episcopalian, was elected chaplain general of the UNIA in 1920. McGuire wrote the UNIA's official liturgy, the Universal Negro Ritual and the Universal Negro Catechism that set forth the teachings of the UNIA. He attempted to shape the UNIA into a Christian black nationalist organization. Garvey, however, did not want the organization to take on the trappings of one particular denomination for he did not want to offend any of its members. Okay, so a lot of people are talking about Garvey and saying, oh, another criticism was that, you know, they say, well, you know, he was Christian and, you know, he's a sellout because he's a Christian, that and the other. See, again, people are not doing their research. Okay. Garvey did not want religion in his organization. Okay. He wanted to keep it non-denominational. However, the mindset of our people was Judeo-Christian, okay? And you couldn't come among our people. Okay, I, I, to bring this all home, okay, I grew up in the South as well as the North. Half of my childhood was in the North, other half in the South, okay? And you go down South, okay, one of the first things people do, you know, you can you can just meet somebody for the first time, you know, and before you can you say, oh, what's your name? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 I'm so uh, I'm so and so such that before you can even introduce yourself, they they'll ask, uh, 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 what church you go to? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, what church you go to? You know, before you can even get one word out, you know, they want to know what church you go to, you know. So when you talk about the Bible Belt, you know, that's real. You know, and particularly during those times, way back in the days, even more so than now, you know, we're in the information age. We're also we also passed the age of I believe and we're into the age of I know, 
But back then it was the age of I believe. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you wasn't a believer, you know, people didn't really want to hear what you had to say. Okay. So Bagavi did not really want a particular religion for the organization. He did have an affinity for Islam. Okay. But even with that, he did not want even that because he had followers from different religious persuasions. Some of his, not all of his followers were Christians. Some of them were Muslims. Some of them were Israelites, were Hebrew. You know what I'm saying? So, and some of them, you know, just were, you know, non-religious. So he didn't want to offend any particular sect. So he really wanted to keep religion out of it. You know, but anyway, I just wanted to add on to that. See, I'm telling you these things because, as I said before, I was part of a Garvey organization in my younger years, and I used to distribute the Garvey literature. So I know quite a bit about Garvey and his movement. So I'm, as I'm reading this to you all, I'm interjecting based on the things that I had learned from the elders when I was with that movement. You know what I'm saying? And also from the books that I've read on Garvey and his movement. Okay, so reading on, it says here that Garvey did not want to offend any of his members, so he wanted it to be non-denominational. McGuire left UNIA in 1921 to begin his own church, the African Orthodox Church, a black nationalist neat a black nationalist neo-Anglican denomination that kept close ties with the UNIA. The UNIA meetings at Liberty Hall in Harlem were rich with religious ritual and language, as Randall Burkett points out in his book, Black Redemption, churchmen speak for the Garvey movement. For even though Garvey rejected McGuire's effort to transform the UNIA into a black nationalist Christian denomination, he blended these two traditions in his message and in the form of his UNIA meetings. A typical meeting followed this order. The hymn, Shine On, Eternal Light, written specifically for the UNIA by its music director. A reading of Psalm 6831, Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch forth her hands unto God. Okay. So, as you see there, like I pointed out yesterday, a lot of our people at that time, their concepts about humanity's origins were centered towards the East. Okay via the Bible, okay, as you see here with the psalm right here, Psalm 68, okay, you know, where it says, princes shall come out of Africa, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God, okay, and a lot of our people were, you know, studying and bringing about what they call liberation theology and stuff like that and looking at the Bible and say, okay, well, these people were, I'm using the word quote unquote, in parentheses, black, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, so they're saying, oh, yeah, this is where we come from, blah, 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 and things of that nature. Okay. Again, because of the Christian influence. All right. So it says here, the official opening hymn from Greenland's icy mountains stating a commitment to the Christianization of Africa. Recitation of the official motto, One God, One Aim, One Destiny, the Lord's Prayer, and other prayers spoken by the chaplain, a sermon or some brief remarks, the business meeting, the closing hymn, either Onward Christian Soldiers or the UNIA's National Anthem, the Universal Negro Anthem. Garvey's Black Nationalism blended with his Christian outlook rather dramatically 
when he claimed that African Americans would view God through their own spectacles. If whites could view God as white, then blacks could view God as black. In 1924, the convention canonized Jesus Christ as a black man of sorrows and the Virgin Mary as a black Madonna. Garvey used that image as an inspiration to succeed in, his, in this life for African Americans needed to worship a God that understood their plight, understood their suffering, and would help them overcome their present state. Garvey was not interested in promoting hope in the afterlife. Success in this life was the key. Achieving economic, cultural, social, and political success would free African Americans in this life. The afterlife would take on I'm sorry, the afterlife would take care of itself. Perhaps Garvey's greatest genius was taking that message of material, social, and political success and transforming it into a religious message, one that could lead to conversation. I'm sorry, not conversation, one that would lead to conversion, one that did not challenge the basic doctrines of his followers, but incorporated them into the whole of his vision. One of Garvey's top ministers gave witness to the powerful effect that message when he of that message when he claimed in 1920, I feel that I am full fledged. I feel that I am a full fledged minister of the African gospel. Garvey's message of black nationalism and a free black Africa met considerable resistance from other African American leaders. W.E.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP and Chandler Owen and A. Philip Randolph of the publication Messenger had their doubts about Garvey. By 1922, his rhetoric shifted away from a confrontational stance against white America to a position of separatism mixed with just enough cooperation. He applauded whites who promoted the idea of sending African Americans back to Africa. He even met with a prominent leader of the Ku Klux Klan in Atlanta in 1922 to discuss their views on miscegenation and social equality. Okay, and let me stop right there. So people are bringing up the issue and we spoke about that in the previous lectures already, but I'm just revisiting it for whoever may be new. When Garvey met with the Klan, it wasn't that he was praising the Klan or trying to build an alliance with the Klan. It's that Garvey was like, we don't want anything to do with Caucasian folk. You know, we're not interested in integrating with you. We're not trying to marry into your race and all that other stuff. You know, you know, so we don't have a problem. Y'all stay your monkey ass is over where y'all are at and we stay over here okay and so the garvey ideology was african centered so with the ku klux klan wanting separation he didn't have a problem with that because like yeah we want to get away from you bastards anyway so you know let's sit down and talk and see how we could stay the hell out of each other's way. Okay. So that's why he met with the Klan. It had nothing to do with trying to be part of the Klan as a lot of people are trying to make it out to be. People are taking information out of context. Okay. So anyway, so it says here, the meeting only gave more fuel to his critics. In 1924, Dubois claimed that Marcus Garvey was the, is the most dangerous enemy of the Negro race in America and in the world. Owen and Randolph, whose paper saw the race issue as one of class more than skin color, called Garvey the messenger boy of the Klan and a supreme Negro Jamaican jackass, while labeling his organization the uninformed Negroes infamous infamous association. 
the federal government also took interest in Garvey in 1922 and in, indicted him and indicted him for mail fraud. He was eventually sentenced to prison and began serving his sentence in 1925. When his sentence was commuted two years later, Garvey was deported to Jamaica. With his imprisonment and deportation, his organization in the United States lost much of its momentum. Garvey spent the last years of his life in London and died in 1940. Okay, so... Let's see here. Yeah, so I just wanted to... There's more to this article, and if you want to read more of that article, that article is from nationalhumanitycenter.org, and you just, you know, search for the article on Marcus Garvey. Okay, so what I now want to, and we may go back over some of these other parts of this article, but I just wanted to touch on certain points in that particular article uh, for this discussion. But what I really want to do now is shift a little bit in the interest of time and talk about Garvey and the era that he came from. Okay. So again, when you talk about our Aboriginal history and things of that nature. Again, during Garvey's time, there was no Aboriginal movements, okay? So you can't accuse Garvey of trying to take the Aborigines off of the land and disenfranchise them, blah, 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 because that movement did not exist back then, okay? And Garvey was just one out of many, 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 as we already showed. I already showed you a list of a long list of people who came before Garvey with the same type of ideology and program of a back to Africa movement. OK, and what I want to do now is take a look at another individual who was before Garvey. OK, and. Yeah, and, and I know that I went through a long list of people before Garvey in the past presentations. So now I'm going to bring you even another one that was before Garvey, okay? And we're going to pull up the article. Unfortunately, I can't share the article. I don't know how to, if you, I don't think you can screen share on YouTube Live when my minutes kick back in next month on StreamYard, then I'll be able to share documents with you where you can see it on the screen. But for right now, I'm just going to have to give you the source and let you read it, you know, let you look it up on your own. Okay, so right now we want to look at an individual by the name of Benjamin Pap Singleton, okay? And Benjamin Singleton, they called him Pap, okay? Benjamin Singleton was way before Garvey was even born, okay? Long probably before his parents were even born, okay? And... Benjamin Singleton was another proponent of a back to Africa movement. Okay, so what I'm gonna read to you right now is from Kansapedia, Kansas Historical Society. Okay, and it says here, Benjamin Pap Singleton, father of the African American Exodus, born 1809, Nashville, Tennessee, died February 17th, 1900, in Kansas City, Missouri. He was born a slave in 1909, 
But after 37 years of bondage, Benjamin Singleton escaped to freedom. He made Detroit his home and operated a secret boarding house for other escaped slaves. Following emancipation, Singleton returned to his native Tennessee. After the Civil War, African Americans in the South enjoyed the rights and privileges of American citizenship. But when the federal troops were removed, their rights were no longer secure. The Ku Klux Klan emerged to strike terror and death to blacks who refused to submit to their will. A sharecropping system virtually re-enslaved black tenant farmers. Because Kansas, I'm sorry, because Kansas was famous for John Brown's efforts and its struggles against slavery, Singleton considered the state a new Canaan. And he, like a black Moses, would lead his people to the promised land. Okay, so people who are criticizing Garvey saying he was, you know, egocentric, you know, because he called himself Moses and, you know, black uh, uh, Marcus Mosiah Garvey and Moses, you know. At that particular time, again, our people were religious minded. Okay. And they flocked around personalities who came with a religious type of ideology, okay, or something religious in their message, okay? So you find a lot of people during that time calling themselves, you know, uh, a Moses or, you know, a prophet, you know, or a messenger or a redeemer and, you know, because that's what our people like. Our people like to follow personalities like that, okay? So it's, Garvey was not the only one. Okay, him and a long line of others. Okay, so those who just single Garvey out are not doing their research. Okay, so reading on says here Singleton distributed promotional posters and handbills which touted sunny Kansas as one of the finest countries for a poor man in the world with plenty of stone and water and wood on the streams. One poster described, one poster described large tracts of land, peaceful homes and firesides undisturbed by anyone. Between 1877 and 1879, nearly 300 African Americans followed him to Kansas. Some lived in Singleton's County in Cherokee, I'm sorry, some lived in Singleton's colony in Cherokee County. Others settled in Wyandotte, in Topeka's Tennessee town, and in Dunlap County near present Emporia. Singleton advocated the organized colonization of blacks in communities in Kansas and testified about the Exodusters before a committee of U.S. Congress in 1880. A second wave of nearly 20,000 Af African Americans came to Kansas in 1879 and 1880. Unlike the first groups of immigrants that had, well, unlike the first group of immigrants that had, hold on, I clicked on the wrong thing. Sorry about that. I left the page. Okay, here we go. That had resources and arrived in small, in smaller organized groups. These exodusters had no money and they arrived daily by the hundreds. The communities in which they tried to settle were already struggling economically and were not prepared for such a spike in population. The communities appealed 
to the state government for assistance, resulting in the creation of the Kansas Freedmen's Relief Association in 1879. The mission of KFRA, K-F-R-A, was to collect and distribute resources for struggling African Americans in Kansas. Though many African Americans came unprepared, most who remained were able to improve the quality of their lives and made important contributions to the state and the communities in which they lived. Known affectionately as Pap, Benjamin Singleton died in 1900, though his la through I'm sorry, through his last years he took great comfort and pride in the role he played as father of the Negro Exodus. Okay. And that's one article. I want to read this other article too that gets more into uh, Benjamin Papp Singleton. Okay. And this is from Legends of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, legendsofamerica.com. Okay. And it's on Benjamin Papp Singleton leading the Exodusters. Okay. It says the primary leader of the migration of Exodusters to Kansas. Benjamin Papp Singleton was born a slave in Nashville, Tennessee in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 1808, but throughout his life, he was determined to be free. He was trained as a cabinet maker and was sold as a slave several times, but always managed to escape. Eventually, he fled to Canada, then settled in Detroit, Michigan, where he ran a boarding house that frequently sheltered runaway slaves. During the Civil War years, he left Detroit and returned to Nashville under Union Army occupation, living in a large Union camp for refuge, I'm sorry, for fugitive slaves. He made a living building cabinets and coffins. While peddling his products in the late 1860s, Singleton became convinced that his mission was to help his people improve their lives and urged them to acquire farmland in Tennessee. However, whites would not sell productive land to them and he soon took up another tactic, preaching to them to go west to farm and own federal homestead lands. He began scouting land in Kansas in the early 1870s and returned to the South to organize parties to colonize Kansas. In, 18, in 1873, nearly 300 African Americans followed him to Cherokee County and founded Singleton's Colony. Soon, others would settle in Wyandotte, Shawnee, and Lyon County. By 1874, Singleton and his associates had formed the Edgefield Real Estate and Homestead Association in Tennessee, which steered more than 20,000 Black migrants to Kansas between 1877 and 1879. Many of those who came were unprepared and soon left the area leaving in their wake dozens of ghost towns. But for those who stayed, they proved, they improved the quality of their lives and made important contributions to the state and to the communities in which they lived. In 1880, Singleton was called to testify bef before Congress regarding the alarming migration of blacks from the South. In 1881, he used his reputation to bring together blacks into an organization called the Colored United Links in Topeka, Kansas. The objective was to combine financial resources of all African Americans to build black owned businesses, factories and trade schools. The organization was successful enough that the president, that the presidential candidate, I'm sorry, that the presidential candidate, James B. Weaver of the Greenback Party met with the group to discuss combining the two groups. However, membership faltered and the organization soon fell apart 
after 1881. After the failure of the colored United Links, Singleton became convinced that blacks would never be allowed to succeed in the United States. In 1883, he joined up with St. Louis, Missouri businessman Joseph Ware and black minister John Williams, proposing that blacks migrate to the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. However, this idea was short-lived. In 1885, Singleton moved to Kansas City, where he organized the United Transatlantic Society with the goal of having all Blacks relocate from the United States to Africa. So here is another person way before Garvey who had a back to Africa movement. This is way before Garvey. This guy was born like before Garvey's parents were even born. Okay. And so now putting things in its proper historical perspective. So this guy Singleton first was looking to relocate our people within the so-called United States. Okay. However, with all the pushback, he said, yo, forget this, you know, let's look to Africa where, you know, it's nothing but our people there and let's see what we could do there. Okay. Again, people were trying to find a power, a place where they could set up a power base. Okay. It's not that they were trying to run away. It's not that they were trying to take the Aborigines off the land and things of that nature. You have to put yourself in that particular era of time. Okay. And look at it through that lens, not taking your current mindset and current ideologies and making them retroactive because it, it doesn't make sense for that particular place in history and time in history. Okay. So reading on, it says here, so he organized the United Transatlantic Society with the goal of having all blacks relocate from the United States to Africa. Though the group lasted until 1887, it never managed to send anyone to Africa. Finally, his health. So again, so it never managed. So people criticizing Garvey and saying Garvey never went to Africa, this, that, and the other. Okay. He wasn't the only one who was not successful in doing that. Okay. You got to look at the social and political situations and circumstances that were going on at the time. Okay. You got a lot of puppet leaders in Africa. You got a lot of coons in Africa, just like you got coons right here. Okay. And you had the coons over here going over to Africa and trying to cock block what Garvey was doing. Okay. And they were also working with the establishment. Okay, and the NAACP, Dubois, and that whole team were going over and trying to cock block what, what Garvey was doing. And they were hired to go over there um, to cock block what Garvey was doing. Okay, so again, you got to do deeper research. You know, you can't just do, you know, surface knowledge research and try to criticize people and events when you don't really know what was going on at the time, okay? So he was unsuccessful in relocating people to Africa. It says, though the group, um, he says, yeah, so it says the group um, never managed to send anyone to Africa. Finally, his health deteriorating, Singleton retired from his life of activism. However, he spoke up one final time in 1889 when the call was raised for a portion of the newly opened Oklahoma Territory to be reserved as an all-black state. 
For many years, it was believed that Benjamin Singleton died in 1892 and the location of his grave was unknown. However, according to the Kansas Historical Society, it was discovered through digitized records that he actually lived until February 17th, 1900 and died at the age of 91 in Jackson, Missouri, in Jackson County, Missouri, and is said to be buried in an unmarked grave at Union Cemetery in Kansas City, Missouri. Today, there is one remaining town that Exodusters established from the South, Nicodemus, Kansas. Today, it is a national historic site. Okay. So, yeah, that's, you know, pretty much what I wanted to do is continue this conversation on Garvey because there are still some who are not convinced, you know, and I get the comments and I get the emails and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm continuing. Like I said, there's a whole lot more to this discussion. Like I said, I got about 800 more hours of information on this topic, on just Garvey alone, let alone. We haven't even really even talked about the Moors and Indians discussion yet you know, the, the amount of hours I got on that. <laughs> we, we ain't even got off Garvey yet, you know. Next up, after we finish the discussion on Garvey, because I will be having some guests come in and speak on Garvey who have some hands-on information. I'm not going to say who. However, it's coming up within the next couple of weeks, okay? Okay. But once we get past Garvey, we're going to continue this discussion of Moors and Indians. And even right now, this is all fits in. It all fits in. It's all relevant. It's all interconnected. Okay. Because you had Garvey and Noble Drew Ali connected. Okay. And so it's all, it all fits in. Okay. But. Once I'm through with the Moors and Indians lecture, you're going to see beyond a shadow of a doubt that Moors are indeed Aboriginal to the land. Okay. And if you look at the previous discussions that led up to this discussion, you know, I pretty much had proven that already. But there's still more, you know, coming up soon. I will show you where even the titles, Eel and Bay and the different Moorish titles, I'm going to show you how those were found here in ancient America. Okay. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to do a nice presentation on that. I'm going to show you how the Fez was born. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you how the Fez was indigenous here in ancient America. Okay. I'm going to show you that, you know a whole lot you know like I said I've been doing this for three decades I can do I can literally I can do this all day long I can do this I can do this discussion for 365 more days without repeating any information okay that's how long the fierce truth seeker has been doing this all right so not trying to toot my horn or anything like that, but you know, I am just letting you know my track record and that when I make these statements, I have the receipts to back them up. Okay. So anyway, I thank all that join. Let's see, let's see who we have in the chat here. We didn't even get a chance to look. Let's see who we have here. Uh, let's see. Umar Carlton says, Umar Johnson is always talking about Marcus. Yeah, you know, he's on that whole, you know, pan-African thing and all that, you know. You know, that's not what we're talking about here, but, you know. Yeah, he talks about Marcus, you know. Like I say, I got, you know, a lot of respect for Marcus. God. Again, I'm not a pan-Africanist, you know. 
and all of that. You know, I'm just pre- I'm just presenting information on Marcus Garvey that a lot of people don't have. You know, I'm not trying to tell anyone that they're African and they're not Aboriginal or anything like that. I'm not trying to do that. You know, all I'm trying to do is give an accurate discussion on the movements that have sprung up among our people here in this country and tell the truth about different personalities and things of that nature, put things in its proper historical context, you know, that's what I'm doing, but I'm not a Pan-Africanist, you know, I mean, I'm not against, you know, I'm not against Africa, I don't have anything against Africa, like I said before, you know, I have a lot of respect for Africa and Africa's history, you know, I like the music, I like a lot of their, their food and things of that nature. I don't have anything personally against Africa, you know, but my particular fight is right here, okay, because that is who we are. Now, that's not to say, again, that's not to say that we don't have any African in our ancestry and things of that nature, okay? You know, we don't know, you don't know what you have in your ancestry because, you know, if you go back thousands of years, people travel, people migrate, you know, and again, you had Mali and Moors that came here, you had Kemites that came here, you know, and things of that nature, you know, so, you know, you don't know, you know, you had people from the continent that migrated here, escaping persecution and things of that nature and married into the tribes. That's a fact and another story for another time. Okay. However, just because you have that included in your ancestry, inclusion is not equal to place of origin. Okay. We are an indigenous or autochthonous people who have had people come here and marry into various tribes and things of that nature, okay? But we are autochthonous to the land, most of us, you know? And that's no disrespect to those who have ancestry that they can trace to Akibulan, or over in the east okay but i'm saying all that to say that you know my fight is here but i have nothing against africa i lived in africa before so i did research and fact finding in africa so you know i don't have anything against africa you know i probably go back there again okay so it's a beautiful place all right and, you know, but to advocate Pan-Africanism, when you study the history of Pan-Africanism, a lot of those leaders who were talking Pan-Africanism back in the days, a lot of them were only talking about Pan-Africanism in terms of those who were indigenous Africans. And we're not interested in so-called African-Americans. Again, I say so-called, okay? They were interested in uniting among their own, okay? You do that research and you'll see that what I'm saying is true, okay? So I'm not a Pan-Africanist, you know? However, I'm not against, you know, doing business and things of that nature with Africans and people, you know, on the continent, you know what I'm saying? Import, export, things of that nature. And, you know, those who, you know, have some type of consciousness about themselves or whatever, I'm not against that, you know, but, you know, with that being said, I thank all. We also have PNF 
in the house. Ha, PNF. Yeah, the good brother PNF, Lord of the Crickets. So, yeah, for those who are in the chat, you know, definitely check out those who are in the chat and those who are uh, listening. Definitely go over and check out PNF's channel. Okay, he's got some some good information and things of that nature. Okay, so definitely pay his channel a visit. You know, subscribe and like. You know. And, you know, we all support each other, you know. And for those who didn't get a chance, definitely, if you can hit the thumbs up here, that would be great. And I also, for those who are generous enough to leave a donation, um, there's a cash app um, there, um, dollar sign, capital K, love, L-O-V-E, 83, okay. And... And we also have, okay, Cherokee Love joins in in the comment section. Says, oh, she, oh, she, oh, oh, yeah. And, yeah, I thank everyone who were able to join in, you know. And if anyone has questions, you know, I'm not above, you know, critique. And I'm not above, you know, asking questions. And, you know, because the whole goal is, um, you know, instead of, you know, it's not about even, you know, baiting each other and stuff like that, you know, let's look at information and let's research it together. You know, if someone has a question, we look at it, we put it on the table, we chop it up, you know, and look at it from different perspectives. You know, that's what it's about. You know, that's how we all grow, you know, and I, I like, I like for my forum to be one of open discussion where, you know, we can look at things and put them on the table without having to be at each other's throats. You know, for some reason, it's only our people that, you know, feel that we have to fight each other just over ideology. Why do we have to do that? You know, it, it, I, I, do, I don't understand it. You know, we can always agree the old law. If we can agree to disagree, you know, or we can also, you know, put ideas and stuff on the table, you know, and just look at them and, you know, do the research together. Hey, if I have, you know, some information that I can add to that, I'll add to it. If I don't, and then if I don't know, I'll be the first person to say, hey, I don't know. I'll tell someone I don't know in a minute rather than sit up and act like I do know. Okay. And I know people like that. You know, I've gotten into, you know, little, little intellectual squabbles with people and they really didn't know. And instead of saying, you know, I just don't know, you know, they pretend that they know and you know, then they get themselves in a bind, themselves in a bind, you know. And, hey, if you ask me something and I don't know, in a minute I'll say, hey, I don't know. I have to do some more research on that. <laughs> you know, I'll put that disclaimer out in a minute. This way I don't, you know, get myself in trouble and be on the hot seat, you know. So, anyway, you know, I just wanted to do something quick. This is just supposed to be a quick little 45-minute presentation but it wound up going much over but anyway i'll sign off on that note and i part I, I have to ask for your apologies for i'm playing the music in the background to drown out the music from outside because you know they'll take the video down like the video got taken down when i was interviewed by fireberg gray wolf the other day when we played a video they took the video down right in the middle of the lecture for copyright and all that you know so i've done presentations live presentations and they took the videos down well not took the video down. yeah yeah they did that one time they took the video down because i shared a video and then another time because of noise that was playing outside um they put the they said that I couldn't monetize, even though the channel's not monetized, but at some point I probably will monetize the channel, but they say this video would not be able to be monetized because of the music that was playing in the background. It wasn't my, I wasn't even playing the music. It was coming from out in the street, you know? So that's why I have this music here playing in the background. This is royalty free music, okay? So I put that to drown out that stuff from outside. But anyway, I thank everyone 
for joining. And I'm going to sign off now and say, till the next time, da 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 ga ha eh.